So I know some of your listeners and readers and followers. They didn't pick the shortest route to the most money. They don't want to hack their way to just serving whatever the audience is ready to buy right this minute. They're hoping, demanding, seeking to do something else, to make a change happen. That is what creative work does. It's something human, something generous, something that might not work, that makes a change happen. And it's frustrating because all of the noise around us pushes us to make average stuff for average people, to keep track of likes or friends or other nonsense that makes other people happy, but isn't why we set out to do this in the first place. And then money gets tight, so we start to race to the bottom, which is bad because you might win or come in second. And so it's easy to get stuck. It's easy to invent writer's block. It's easy to feel like you're not appreciated. And so what the practice says is there is a method, an approach, a way to do the work you want to do. There are no guarantees that come with it. It might not change the people you seek to change. It might not earn you a dollar. It might not get you applause. It might not work. But it will always work better than anything else you could do. I mean, we were just sitting back, you know, <laughs> chopping it up. Reminiscing about the good old days and all that. I want, to, I want to read a little excerpt to start this thing off. Um, something I read, I think, a little blurb about the book. The practice will help you get unstuck and find the courage to make and share creative work. Seth insists that writer's block is a myth, that consistency is far more important than authenticity, and that experiencing the imposter syndrome is a sign that you're a well-adjusted human. Most of all, he shows you what it takes to turn your passion from a private distraction to a productive contribution, the one you've been seeking to share all along. What number of book is this for you? Is this 18? Or what? We're calling it 20, but it's hard to tell. Well, I've probably got most of them here behind me in my bookshelves. Um, we've become friends over the years. Your friendship means so much to me. Uh, I'll probably edit that part out. Tell me about the practice. You know my audience, um, the people who watch this show, they're, they're freelancers, they're entrepreneurs, they're small business owners. And most of all, I think the common thread through all of them is creativity. Um, this need to create content, whether that's, you know, they're, they're an attorney and they've got this IP, or they're a plumber, or an artist, a painter, um, a filmmaker, a writer, Talk to me about the practice and, and why you wrote this. And you speak from real life experience. I mean, you're the Mickey Mantle, you're the Cal Ripken Jr. of um, blog bloggers, right? Are you still writing consistently every single day? Yes, I have not missed a day. I'm 7,000 plus posts into it. Writing a blog every day has been a fantastic practice for me. I don't know how many people read it, I don't seek to monetize it. That's not what it's for. What it's for is I made a decision one time to write every day. And so I don't have to revisit that decision. I don't post a blog post because I feel like it. And I don't post a blog post because it's perfect. I post a blog post because it's tomorrow. And that idea helps the work move forward. Is this something... Well, let me, let's, let's go back in the chronology 7,000 plus posts ago. Give us some context about what year this was when you decided to start the most, probably arguably, the most interesting, the most read, the most iconic marketing, is that what we're calling it? A marketing blog? Thought, thought leadership blog on the internet. What, what year is this? It started as an email newsletter in 1995. So maybe off the heels of permission marketing, um, this idea of getting people to opt in, to raise their hand, to say, I, I want this, I want to hear from you every day or every week or every month, whatever your frequency is. And, and how did that go? You started writing this newsletter. Did it get traction right away? Or So the purpose at the beginning was pretty simple. I needed to explain to my grandmother what I did for a living. <laughs> and she did not have an email address, but it's the closest I could come. And so there were only 40 people who got it at the beginning. 
and it was about me and the work I was doing. And it was really, it was just a personal journal. And when blogs first showed up, I, I remember Joey Ito, who ran the Media Lab for years, uh, I had just met him that day, the same day I met Jacqueline Novogratz and also Queen Noor, the Queen of Jordan, uh, also Sergey Brin and a whole bunch of other cool people. But two of the people I remember the best were Jacqueline Novogratz and Joey Ito. And I looked at Joey's laptop and he had this thing open and it was called TypePad. I said, that's beautiful. And he explained to me what it was. And I knew it, known about Blogger before that, but it was TypePad that looked like I wanted to look. And I said in that moment, I'm going to shift my email newsletter to this platform and start writing for other people, not just about me. And I was, some days I would write three blog posts. I would skip days. I didn't have a calendar in mind, but about a hundred days into it, I was being read maybe by 50 or a hundred people a day. Then I started to write a blog that sounded like my blog. I wrote a, a blog post about the Apple store and then I wrote a blog post called The Provincetown Helmet Insight about why and how people in Provincetown, Massachusetts were wearing bikes, helmets when they rented bikes. And once I found that voice, I knew I was in it. And then I got a little carried away and some days I would do six or seven posts and my readers were complaining because apparently it bothered them that they weren't reading all the posts. And people were writing me notes saying, you're posting too often, I would write back, well, then don't read them all. And like, no, I want to read them all. Post less often. And so then I compromised on every day. Yeah. I can hear you saying, well, there's a daily newspaper, you know, <laughs> come on. Uh, so many questions and thoughts are going through my mind right now. I mean, the context, I think, is important because did you say 95 or 97? Well, I started one of the first internet companies in 1991, 92, before the World Wide Web. E the email newsletter started, you know, sometimes in 95, probably. I can't, I can't find it. It's gone. I did not believe in the World Wide Web. When Mark Hurst showed it to me for the first time, I said, that's stupid. It's like Prodigy, but without a business model and slower. I just completely missed it. I thought online services matched my understanding of how this medium was going to develop. And it totally took me by surprise that it was going to be open and free. Yeah, I remember your painful um, $800 million <laughs> uh, loss story. That's still, that, that one sticks with me. And I've got a, I've got a couple of my own since then. Um, it was funny because I made a video about this, sort of inspired by that story that you told me. Um, here I am doing behind the brand. Well, two things happened. You know. I started in 2009, 2010. I'm a decade plus two years into this. And in 2016, someone at NPR who was paying attention launched a little podcast called How I Built This, which is uh, coincidentally has the exact same tagline as Behind the Brand, which says it's a show about innovators, entrepreneurs, and the stories behind their success. So someone over there at NPR is paying attention to what I was doing, I think, or maybe it was just total coincidence. Uh, but it's now their most successful podcast in the history of NPR. Yeah. And then I also read in TechCrunch like two months ago that this company called Masterclass started, which is also sort of a very similar kind of concept, taking, you know, masters, people who know what they're talking about, doing interviews. I mean, it's sort of like a Masterclass style, workshop style, but it, it really is just fancy interviews, kind of like mine. And, um, and they were valued at $800 million. And so <laughs> I was like, okay, just, just keep going. <laughs> just keep Congratulations. Going. Well done, sir. It means you're onto something. It means, you're, it means that the universe is attuned to you and vice versa. Yeah, my wife says it builds character, so we'll <laughs> see. Um, but no, that's a great story. And, and I think the context matters on when you started... Um, creating this content because it it wasn't like it is now. And you could argue, and maybe I'll ask you the question before I attempt to answer it. Do you think with all the noise, and that's, you know, blogs, videos, podcasts, etc., is now the best time or the worst time to start something new? Now. Now is the best time. There's no question about it. 
that it's super easy to point to the person who came before and say, it's too late, that ship has sailed. Well, you know, Facebook launched years after Friendster. And I mean, go down the list. Being first is, you don't get a big prize for being first. That it's fun, I love to go first, but that's not the point. The thing is, I had to persuade people. I can show you this in my business plan. I had to persuade people that one day folks would have email. That was a key stumbling block in raising money for my company. One day people would have email. Well, now we don't have to have that discussion anymore. So now if you want to build, I just saw it the other day, a YouTube channel that does nothing but show people how, with, with wordless videos, how to restore old metal toys from the 60s, there's nothing stopping you. And he regularly gets 5 million views per broadcast. Now, what does 5 million mean? If I think about Mad Men, considered one of the two greatest TV shows ever made, Mad Men was seen by 3 million people an episode. This guy, who is busy refinishing Tonka trucks from 1964, has 5 million viewers per episode. So, yeah, this is the moment right now. Right now. Yeah. And let's underscore how important it is to find a niche like that. You know, and you talked to me before, and it's been so educational and important for my business, too, as a writer, director, producer, having this little production company, um, focusing on minimum viable audience instead of critical mass. Because I don't need critical mass. I mean, my critical mass is probably 10. <laughs> You know, if I can do 10 projects a month or a year, you know, it's a small number, right? And so that's a whole lot easier exercise than trying to get even 5 million. Yeah, but easier, easier is not the point. I want to argue there's something emotionally difficult about connecting to the smallest viable audience, and it's this. If you can identify exactly who you are seeking to serve, and they don't like what you do, you have to own that. You can't say, well, there's plenty of other people. No, you pick the people. So the question is, do you want to be on the hook or not? And I think on the hook is the best place to be. And my book is really about being on the hook. And too often, when we're racing around trying to be with the cool kids, what we're hoping to do is let be off the hook, be just invisible enough that it's not on us. And I think the practice is informed by a desire to be responsible. Yeah, I think that's a super good message. That is, it's worth, I mean, you've been carrying that flag around, waving it for years. I, I can hear sort of shun the non-believers echoing in my, in my mind, minimum viable product, minimum viable audience. It's still hard. Oh, yeah. It's difficult oh, yeah. because the optics they matter to either us because of vanity or pride or ego. They matter to other people because if we're looking for partnerships or, you know, here's the question I get asked when I get pitched. So at this point, people are pitching me to be on my show, which is terrific. I love it. And there's some really great ones. But the question is always this. Who else has done this before our client? <laughs> That's the number one question. And to me, it's indicative of how important the optics are sometimes to other people. Right. Because they want to feel safe. They, they don't want to maybe take a risk and have their job at risk if no one shows up to my party. You know, it's like, yeah, no, I mean, there is a reason that most people don't want to do art, that industrialism was such an easy sell that we said to people, you don't have to make decisions. You don't have to decide what to buy, buy what everyone else is buying. The, the, the local big box store doesn't sell everything. And you don't have to decide where to work. Just go to the placement office and get a job with whoever's hiring. You don't have to decide what to do all day because your boss will tell you what to do all day. And, you know, back for the early years of Twitter, for years and years and years, more than half the people using Twitter never, ever tweeted. They just consumed tweets. Because it's safer. And, you know, people talk about how many folks are on YouTube or how many podcasts there are. Yeah, but 98% of the people in the world have never made a podcast. Because it's easier to listen than it is to speak. 
let's go back to the practice when we get stuck. So we talked about some of the things that get us stuck. We worry about what other people are thinking. We worry about the optics. What do we do when the people that we picked don't love our stuff? Then what do we do? We begin by understanding that all criticism is not the same. That there is the criticism of, it's not for me. I don't like white chocolate. Does that mean that white chocolate is bad? No. It just means I'm the kind of person that doesn't like white chocolate. That doesn't mean you should stop making it. It doesn't mean you should say your white chocolate is defective. It's just not for me. So often we will make something for the wrong group in the wrong way. Or some criticism is super valuable, but our instinct is to ignore it because we're so used to the wrong kind of criticism. But when we stumble on the right kind of criticism, where someone with insight and patience and kindness and care says to us, did you think about this? We have to be careful that our knee-jerk reaction isn't, I'm a creator, leave me alone. And that distinction, that, that leap right there, super, super difficult to do. But the great creators, they are either super lucky when they ignore those people, or they don't ignore those people. Instead, they say, Thank you. You just gave me a clue, a magical clue. Thank you. I just had a couple of ideas when you were telling me that, but I want to ask a follow-up question, which is, you know, the quote that Henry Ford gets credited with, the, you know, if they would have asked me what I wanted, I would have said, uh, they would have said they wanted a faster horse. Instead, he revolutionized, you know, the five-day work week and, you know, steering away from child labor and make it affordable for his employees to own Ford vehicles through this process is really what he perfected is the process. So so what are some of the signals that we should key into to know or distinguish between the right kind of feedback and the wrong kind of feedback? Yeah. The typical untrained person is pretty good at telling you what they want or need. They're terrible at telling you how they can satisfy their wants or needs. They will almost always say, I want what I used to have, but cheaper or faster or more of it. And that's not anything related to their wants and needs. So if we think about anything, you know, let's talk about uh, Blake and Tom's shoes. How did he build a half a billion dollar company? Because the thing is, every single person who purchased a pair of shoes from him already had a pair of shoes. Every one of them. So what was he selling them? They didn't have a need. One of my favorite stories is like in the first three or four months after starting Tom's, I was in New York City and I ran into this girl in the airport and she was wearing a red pair of Tom's. And um, I had never seen a stranger wearing our shoes. So imagine this, like I you know, started this company and in my apartment here in Venice, I'm in New York trying to get more stores to buy the shoes, actually totally struck out. I was not having a good day. I go to American Airlines, I'm checking in, and there's this woman, mid-30s, you know, wearing a pair of red tops. Yeah, you're, it's like a singer hearing yeah, her first hearing on the radio. Yeah, hearing their first on the radio, exactly. Yeah, awesome. And so I hear this, and I, or here this, I see this, and I say to her, um, I couldn't help but noticing these awesome red shoes, you know, what are they? Because I'm curious to hear her story of how she got them, like where'd she get them? Yeah. And, and so, but at the same time, I don't want to give away who I am. So she looks at me and she says, they're Tom's. And I was like, oh, cool. And I'm doing the check-in, you know, still. And she really wanted my attention. So she literally physically grabbed my shoulder as a stranger in the airport and said, no, you don't understand. This is the most amazing company in the world. When I bought this pair of shoes, they gave a pair to a child in Argentina. And there's this guy who started the company. He lives in Los Angeles. I think he lives on a boat. I mean, literally, she started telling me like my life story, word for word, like more passion than my mom tells it, right? She was and invested. She was invested. And so I said to her, this is the kind of funny part of the story, I said to her, I said, you know, I had to tell her I was, right? So I said, uh, actually, you know, I'm Blake. I started Tom's. And she looks at me like, you're in headlines. And she goes, why did you cut your hair? <laughs> that was her one question. Because I had like long hair in the, in the uh, YouTube videos that she saw me giving shoes away. And I cut it that summer. But the thing is, my point in sharing that is, is I recognize at that moment that if we had enough of those people, like who were talking, telling our story to strangers in the airport, that if we could just 
really focus on that metric of having as many of those people involved in Tom's and actually equipping them by taking them on giving trips and, and giving them you know access to me and, and the whole thing, they would build the movement at Tom's. And I think that's you know how we scaled and you know grew you know so fast in, in such a short period of time. Yeah. Well, it was tricky, but it involves listening super carefully. Because what he understood about his initial target audience was these there weren't many of them, 28-year-old women who were semi-fashion forward but weren't willing to go buy $600 Louboutins, needed something to increase their status. They needed something to tell their friends about that they got before their friends. They wanted, in fact, to make their friends feel a little left out and a little left behind. It gave them pride. It helped them stand a little taller. And so he put a logo on the back of a $90 pair of espadrilles. In those days, there weren't logos on shoes like that. What was the purpose of the logo? The purpose of the logo was simple because Margaret could say to Mildred, what's up with the new shoes? And Mildred could say, I'm a better person than you because I just helped a kid in Ethiopia get shoes. I'm a philanthropist. That was the story. That's what he sold. He didn't sell shoes. And so he gave that person something that they needed. But she never would have told him that in a focus group. And so what we can do is explore what have people done before to satisfy their wants and needs? What would rhyme with that? What would help that person get more of who they seek to be? And it's about affiliation and status roles and a lot of the stuff that was in my previous book. But the hard part is once you see it, to have the guts to be wrong and to say, well, there's no evidence that philanthropic shoes that cost $90 are going to work. Zero evidence. I'm leaping. Here I go. It might not work. And you cover yourself against the downside and you see what happens if 500 people engage. And if you're lucky, you get to do it again. How often are you wrong nowadays? How, how often are you experimenting with new things? I mean, someone looking from the outside in might see you iterating. Sure, here's another book. But he's the book guy. He knows how to do books, words on paper, digital, whatever, you know. Um, maybe we don't get to see all the innovation happening behind the scenes, but I'd like to know, you know, how often now are you experimenting? And built into that question is a, is a backup question, which is how often should we be thinking about innovating? And then how, how often are you wrong? Um, if I'm working hard, I'm wrong almost every single day, sometimes several times a day. Uh, behind me in all these videos, you see bookshelves. Most of the books on these bookshelves are filled with projects I did that didn't work. And uh, I'm good enough to double down on the ones that do work, that it looks like I'm right a lot. 7,000 blog posts, half of them are below average. And 140 podcasts, some of them aren't as good as the other ones. I work for hours on something. It's perfectly polished. I go here, they say, eh. and then I do something because I'm on deadline and I pop it off in eight minutes and people think it's the greatest thing I ever did. I don't know. I just know that the practice involves showing up. Yeah. And so I'm wrong a lot. Now, we're talk there is a spectrum between being wrong about an interaction with one person who you need to connect with and being wrong on a book that you spent a year writing or a business you spent five years building, right? But we got to do all of them. So, yeah, most of my errors are errors of omission, not commission, things I should have done, things I could have said, things I could have written. But there's also the stuff where I've had an interaction or written something where history said you weren't that right this time or where the market said, nah, we're just not going to sign up for this. We don't think it's a good idea. And again, you protect against the downside. The downside for me used to be that if I lost 500 bucks, I was out of the game. So I had to take very little swings. Now I can afford to lose 500 bucks and still be in the game. So I take slightly bigger swings. But no, I'm not busy starting a startup with 100 employees because that's a swing that would freak me out. Yeah. <laughs> so the message is to put yourself out there, try and fail. It's, it's back to themes from linchpin, poke the box, you know, the person who fails the most wins. Um, let me ask you about book updates. Some authors will go and they will update a book 
to my knowledge, you haven't done that. You know, like here's the twenty first, you know, year anniversary of this book. Let's update it with new information. Have you ever done that? Have you thought about it or been tempted to? Uh, my publisher had me write a couple, uh, like a new introduction to Purple Cow, and I added a couple things. Um, right after Permission Marketing became a hit, they said, will you please write the Permission Marketing hand? And then, of course, you could go start, I don't know, call it MailChimp if you want. Doing sequels is not that interesting to me, and rewriting something is less interesting. Because the minute I rewrite it, I have to rewrite it again. Whereas if I point to a book that I wrote, like Tribes, to 11 years ago, I can say, in that moment, that was the way I was thinking. I'm not pretending it's up to date. It doesn't include anything about the fracturing of our culture. And if I did try to update it, it wouldn't be a pure thing in and of itself. It would just be a book from before, updated for now, and it doesn't rhyme with itself. And so I have the luxury of being able to not do that for a living. It's okay if someone wants to do that for a living, because guess what? The market likes that. The market likes it that all the Marvel movies look the same. That's why they all look the same, because there's a need to do something that feels safe. Yeah, nostalgia is a big theme across many different products and services. Things, even archetypes or actors that remind us of other actors, you know, who've gone before. That's deliberate, you know. Um, I've got this book behind me called Save the Cat. It's a great book. It's over here probably. Save the Cat, and it talks about, you know, how there's only 10 or 11 stories that exist in the world, and it talks about yeah. archetypes. It's a very interesting read on uh, filmmaking and writing scripts and whatnot, but it's applicable, what you're saying, you know, to choose that strategy or not choose it based on nostalgia or pe what people recognize or what they're familiar with. Starting from scratch is difficult. Change is, no one wants change usually. Well, not no one. And that's, this is the key. The smallest viable audience comes back again because the biggest possible audience wants safety and it wants affiliation and it wants to be part of something that it knows is going to be the way it's supposed to be. But there are always in every market, the early adopters, the people who want to go first, the people who say what's new, not what works. Yeah. So if we want to innovate, we have to ignore the masses. We have to ignore the fact that, quote, no one has ever heard of you. Well, almost no one has ever heard of you, but the right people have. It, it reminds me of a talk I heard, I think it was Liz Gilbert, who wrote Eat, Pray, Love. And she, yeah. she gave this talk. Great being. And what stuck with me most and still sort of haunts me to this day, and something I struggle with all the time, if you want to call it, you know, in my practice, is, is our best work behind us? We've done something great. How do, you, how do you replicate it? Once you've done something tremendous, you know, the pressure of recreating the magic, what, wow. do, you, what do you do? Um, something kind of peculiar has happened recently in my life and in my career, which has caused me to have to sort of recalibrate my whole relationship with this work. And um, the peculiar thing is that I recently wrote this book, this memoir called Eat, Pray, Love, um, which decidedly, unlike any of my previous books, um, went out in the world for some reason and became this big mega sensation international bestseller thing. The result of which is that everywhere I go now, people treat me like I'm doomed. Um, seriously, doomed, doomed. Like they come up to me now like all worried and they say, aren't you afraid? Um, aren't you afraid you're never gonna be able to top that? Um, aren't you afraid you're gonna keep writing for your whole life and you're never again gonna create a book that anybody in the world cares about at all, ever? Again? Aren't you afraid you're never going to have any success? Aren't you afraid the humiliation of rejection will kill you? Aren't you afraid that you're going to work your whole life at this craft and nothing's ever going to come of it and you're going to die on a scrap heap of broken dreams with your mouth filled with bitter ash of failure? I, I should just put it bluntly because we're all sort of friends here now. It's exceedingly likely that my greatest success is behind me. You know, um, so Jesus, what a thought, you know, like that's the kind of thought that could lead a person to start drinking gin at nine o'clock in the morning. And, 
you know, I don't want to go there. You know, I would prefer to keep doing this work that I love. And so the question becomes how. You know? So she's just one of my patron saints. I think she's an extraordinary human. I was 20 feet from her when she gave her TED Talk. And in the talk, she explains that after she wrote Eat, Pray, Love, which was a sensation, Julia Roberts, millions of copies sold, a book that confounded all expectations. Her publisher pays her a lot of money to write a new book. She writes the whole book. She's at the copy shop making a copy of her only copy to submit the finished book to the publisher. And she looks at it and she throws it in the trash. And she says to herself in that moment, I can never top that book. And I got all choked up. And after her talk, I, I ran up to her and I said, don't you dare. Don't you dare throw another book in the trash. Your job is not to be better than the old Liz Gilbert. The old Liz Gilbert's gone forever. The old any of us is gone forever. Your job is to be the best version of what you've got right now based on what's around you and the change you seek to make. Don't play covers. We need new originals. And it's the people who keep trying to recapture that old thing that happened mostly because of luck that end up bitter and disconnected because it was luck. And it might come back or it might not. But playing covers and making sequels, you can do better than that. So I didn't say that as cogently to Liz, and, I, and Liz already understood what I was getting at. I didn't teach her anything. But um, to feel like someone that brilliant was laboring under so much pressure, it's not worth it. And, and I, I don't know for sure, but I would guess if I'm reading into that story that part of it was her own perfectionism and mm -hmm. ambition and talent and genius, but also some of it was the pressure of, let's call them the stockholders or the stakeholders, right? Sure. Someone had written her a big check and she wanted to deliver because she has integrity and you know she has a reputation to uphold. So we're back to the optics. <laughs> we're back to the optics. This is the irony of the situation. The irony of the situation. I was talking to somebody the other day and they said, well, I just, I'm just waiting for a really, really good idea. I said, oh, you mean a really good idea? Like, let's make a Broadway show about an obscure figure in the Revolutionary War. Let's have everyone in the musical be played by someone of color. And let's make sure that the music isn't like anything people have heard on Broadway before. That kind of great idea. Is that what you're waiting for? Because that's a terrible idea. Except it's the most profitable Broadway show of all time, and it also changed our culture in really profound ways. So nobody knows anything. That's another book you've got on the shelf behind you, William Goldman. Nobody knows anything. But if we try to attach ourselves to the outcome, we will sacrifice the process. That the practice says, the outcome matters. That's why I'm here. It's why it's work. But no. I'm not sacrificing the practice to reverse engineer some outcome that I have no control over because I have no control over it. So therefore, all I can do is merely do this work. That, that one gave me goosebumps. I may have it embroidered on a pillow or something. <laughs> I like that. Ooh, good. Cutting right to the quick. I love it. Um, I'm going to throw you some more obstacles or excuses, however you want to interpret it. Um, and mainly for selfish reasons, because I'm there all the time. Um, you and I talked about me writing my book, which is still a work in progress. I think I announced it um, three years ago. And it's still a work in progress. Uh, some of it is exactly butting up against what you're talking about now. So it's, that's super helpful. Uh, and some of it is when life gets in the way. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, a couple of years ago when we were at that event, I, I shared with you that um, I had reunited with my, my dad, my birth father, after a long, you know, search. And it was super happy moment and um, I'm really glad that I shared that when I did I have to tell you sort of more of the backstory which is 
you know, more of your advice. I don't know. It feels like you're in my back pocket sometimes when I need you most. <laughs> um, because I remember you giving a talk or something and you, you talked about like basically, you know, running at the dog, right? I think this might have been a poke the box speech or talk that I hosted or the interview. And, and that's always been great advice. Uh, and, and so I've had these signals like for me personally, when I know that I'm on the right track, uh, one of them is I get like physically nauseous. Like I feel like I want to throw up <laughs> like it's called butterflies or just like this uneasy, right. anxious feeling. But I've learned to, you know, like recognize that, oh, I need to lean into this. I need to run at this because this is a signal, signal that I'm on the right track, not run away. Um, and so, you know, f continuing the search for my dad after a lot of setbacks was was part of that, um, even though even when it was really difficult. And then sharing that personal story in front of a few hundred people was also uh, not that comfortable, very awkward and and it felt terrible, but it turned out to be a really great thing because there's a lot of people that, that watch that and um, who felt like me and also I think, you know, help, uh, maybe that helped them um, do oh, something difficult. Sure. Um, but, but last year, um, I lost my dad unexpectedly. I'm sorry. It was, it was really hard and um, it's one of those it was totally unexpected. He, he passed from a complication. You know, he, he and I had a really straight conversation. He was going in for um, a surgery and he said to me, what do you think? Should I do this? And I said, well, it depends. Uh, you know, risk, risk benefit. You know, what's the risk? The risk is you might not make it out. The benefit, you might be out of chronic pain for the rest of your life, you know. And he was in so much pain that he decided to take the risk. And he actually made it through the surgery, flying colors. And then as a fluke, just caught an infection in the hospital and it, it took him within hours. I'm sorry. Thank you. Um, and if I'm, if I'm being honest, I have been sort of reeling from that for a while. Um, even mm -hmm. use, even maybe using it as a, as a crutch. Um, so what do you what do you do when life seems to get in the way of what you ought to be doing? You know, um, therapy aside, <laughs> what do you do? Well, I think that generosity is a really powerful way out of much of this. And you know, my heart goes out to you to have been separated from him for so long and then to be back together and lose him. I'm so sorry. And there is grief and trauma. And they cannot be denied. But then the question is, this next thing you want to do, who's it for? Is it for you? Like eating another string of black licorice. That's not generous. You like black licorice, you grab a piece. But rescuing a kid who's drowning, that's generous. You're not getting anything out of it. Your clothes are going to get wet. You're not going to win an award. You might get hurt. But of course you're going to jump in and save the kid. He's only three feet away from you. It doesn't matter that you are the best lifeguard in all of California. You are there. It needs to be done. That gets us out of our head really fast. And so generosity in the age of the Internet is challenging because the Internet is a connector, but it's also a mirror. We can see ourselves all the time. Oh, there I am. There I am. How many likes do I have? How many friends do I have? And so this hustle culture has developed, which I hate. The hustle culture of how do I get more attention? How do I get more likes? How do I get my funnel filled up? Because I need to pay the bills. That's always the bottom line. But no, you're not entitled to pay the bills by stealing people's attention. On the other hand, if you show up with something that people need and want, and you can be of service to them, then you've done something important. And so when I think about your dad, who of course I never met, I would imagine that he's most proud of the things you've done for other people and the lights you've turned on and the way you've led them forward. So this book you have in mind 
You're not writing this book for you. You know this book isn't going to build an addition to your house. You're writing this book because there's people who have been in your shoes who need to read it. And life's not getting in the way right now. Fear is getting in the way for good reason. Because, you know, we've trained ourselves to be okay making the video, some of us. But a book, like with real typing and real pages, and it's going to be in the library forever, I'll work on it tomorrow. And so, you know, we started this conversation an hour ago talking about my blog. And my blog is going to be around as long as the internet is going to be here, even after I'm gone. And the same posture is what I bring to my books, which is, I think, really long and hard before I decide it's worth the journey to make a book. But I have never missed a deadline. Not once. Because you made the decision already. And now you just do the work. And doing the work means don't pay attention to the outcome. Don't look for the excuses. Instead, write something. If it's not good, write something better. And keep writing something until the book is done. Yeah, it's got to become like brushing your teeth. It's just something we do. I write a blog post every day, or I write a couple of paragraphs for my book. I think you're, I think you're right. You want to impart some final words on creatives or two creatives? You know, um, obligation is really toxic. Thinking the audience owes you something, the internet owes you something, that the people in the room need to applaud because you worked so hard. And just like getting hooked on the outcome, getting hooked on that obligation, it's just a place to hide. Each of us, even in this crazy upside down world of 2020, is so lucky, so privileged, so connected to more people than at any other time in history. We do this work because we can, not because it's guaranteed to work. The practice is its own reward that we can live a life of utility and generosity and connection and maybe even get rewarded for it, but maybe not. But even so, it's the trying, it's the showing up that matters so much. So I'm so grateful that you give me a chance to come rant with you now and then. And this time is safer than the time a giant set of lights almost fell on my head. So I'm grateful for that too. But if you've got something in you I'm hoping that you'll find a few other people, start a circle, challenge each other, encourage each other, support each other, and ship the work. And if it doesn't work, ship it again. Show up for other people. This is the opportunity of our time. I mean, we were just sitting back, you know, <laughs> chopping it up, reminiscing about the good old days and all that. <laughs> you know, tracking my roots, where I came from and where I'm going. But like I say, man, always said it. It's not about the destination. It's all about the journey. Ain't nothing changed but the weather.